very good afternoon to everyone joining us uh, today to this uh, Horizon Europe brokerage event on the Pandemic Preparedness and Response call. Uh, my name is Samrat Kumar. I work for Euraccess, and this webinar is brought to you in collaboration with the delegation of the European Union to India and with the Department of Biotechnology Government of India. It's a very important call, not only for EU-India collaboration, I would say it's a call which you know addresses challenges on health and pandemic preparedness to all of us. And we saw that we had a, a very good number of registrations today. And we see also that there are quite a significant number of attendees who are interested in this particular call and also are looking for uh, a partner, a consortium, to collaborate and to apply to this call. So we are very happy to welcome you and invite you to this very informative uh, uh, and packed session today. We have a lot of on the table for you. We will present the call, but we will also have the opportunity to listen to scientists who are working in this area who are having ideas for a proposal. Now, without any further delay, I would like to welcome Mr. Pierrick Filon Ashida, who is the uh, first counselor and head of research innovation at the EU delegation uh, to India. Pierrick, um, this is one of your babies, we would say. This co-funding, uh, you've been working very hard uh, the last months. And this this is also a topic, I think, which is of very big interest to the EU, but also to EU-India collaboration. And very happy that you are here to address the participants and give the opening remarks of today's webinar. Thank you, Pierrick. Thank you, Sam Rapt, and thank you to the colleagues. Uh, first of all, um, I introduce myself. I am head at the EU delegation uh, in India, so I'm based in Delhi for research and innovation. Actually, my name is the name of my colleague, Dr. Vivek Dam. Uh, you can see on the screen, so you are, you are not seeing twice, but uh, we are using his links. That's why uh, my name is, uh, is the same as uh, Vivek. Uh, yes, this call, I will introduce a little bit the philosophy of the call. Uh, I will also uh, explain why we are doing such a brokerage event. The first reason is the brokerage event is absolutely necessary to help you to understand the scope of the call. Each call in the way the EU system is working is very specific. So when you speak about prevention, when you speak about treatment, it's not the same. So you have to be very careful on the how you will read and understand the call. And that's why today uh, it's very important that after the sessions, we will have a speaker, Dr. Michael Brown, who will give you some advice. He has been a mandated expert for the EU to help uh, understanding of calls. Uh, also, I want to tell today's uh, appreciation that the EU has because this call is co-organized uh, uh, and the Indian partners are financed by DBT. So we will have a speaker for DBT in conclusion. Uh, it's very important for you to note that when you will put a proposal, at the same time, you will have to put it uh, with your uh, European consortium, but you also have to put it with a DBT in order later on to get funding. Let me just give you a, br a brief introduction of uh, the reason of this pathogen core. The first reason is uh, at the time of COVID, the uh, EU and DBT had an extremely important research cooperation in domain of vaccine treatment. And uh, we found out that uh, teams in Europe and in India will gain to work with, uh, uh, with one another, especially in the domain of pathogen, where there is a specificity in India uh, being on the type of pathogen uh, that we do not necessarily have in Europe, or being on how you conduct clinical studies. So I really recommend when you um, market yourself vis-a-vis -vis European partners that you outline, you emphasize your specificity being in India of your uh, research environment, of your clinical studies, if you are more on, uh, on the hospital side or on the research side, what type, or the type of pathogens that you are looking at because in fact, there are different pathogens uh, that could be looked in this call. Uh, Lassa virus, uh, Nipah, uh, Ebola, Dengue, Yellow Fever, Zika. I cannot say at this stage that the way the EU will look at the proposals will put uh, uh, the different pathogens in competition because there are not pathogens that are more important than others. 
But I will say, uh, being outside of the evaluation process, that what is very important is you integrate in the European team, explaining your history of, of uh, working on the specific areas where you want. For example, if you are working on Hendra virus, uh, what you have done so far at the level of India, maybe at international level, and what you bring to the project. With this, I would like to explain that uh, today we have uh, mainly uh, Indian colleagues, uh, which is really well appreciated. I will listen to you. Uh, the next step is I wish you a good success in uh, finding European partners, and uh, we will help you along. So do not hesitate to keep contact with uh, uh, Samrat from your access, uh, Dr. Vivek Tam in my team. Uh, uh, Dr. Srini, who would speak from CNRS, and uh, other colleagues, Dr. Michael Brown, who is an EU mandated expert, because the steps up to the time of proposal is not easy. So don't give up. You might have already been in some EU uh, proposals, or even better, in EU selected projects. You might be in. Uh, so it means you might know. Uh, what are the steps? Uh, but it's like any administration, there are specific steps and you cannot escape. Uh, but we will be there also with DPT uh, uh, to help you. So Samrat, I uh, completed my brief introduction. I explained a little bit the philosophy of, and the reason of the call. Uh, so it's a budget of 50 million euros, uh, five zero million euros on the EU side. The EU side is going to finance the European partners, and as I already explained twice, DBT will finance the selected Indian partners, and the project size also matters. We are expecting on both sides, by India and by EU, to have a global project of a value of seven to eight million euros, which is quite substantial, but in fact, it's for three to four years, and it can be from five to 10 to more partners, and therefore, even though 8 million euros look a lot of money, uh, it's not it's it's a reasonable amount for, to finance uh, good research. So all the best. Uh, thank you very much, Samrat. I pass you back the floor. Thank you so much, Perik, for um, this very nice introduction and also explaining a bit the context and the background of this call. I think that makes totally sense to see that there is it's not an isolated call. There has been a, a history before uh, between EU and India working on, on, on similar topics. And it's it's very uh, you know, good to know that uh, it has a strong foundation, this call already in the EU-India strategic partnership when it comes to, to health uh, and, and, and the challenges with it. So now uh, with that, um, I would like to welcome Dr. Vivek Dham, who is an advisor at the research innovation section at the EU delegation. We will now present the guidelines for participation. It's kind of the technical aspect of this call. And Vivek, thank you so much uh, for making this presentation and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Samrat. Uh, I'm just trying uh, to share my slides. I hope it is visible. Yeah, and just to be before Vivek, while Vivek is uh, putting up his slides, there is a possibility for you to uh, ask questions in the Q&A. Please do that. Use also the chat maybe to introduce yourself to the other participants. You can maybe, you know, uh, use some keywords of what is your area? What are you looking for? Are you looking for partners or would you like to, you know, uh, find partners? So the chat function, the next two hours and so will be uh, for that to introduce yourself and exchange uh, and start the networking now. Um, sorry, Vivek. Um, now, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just trying to share, but I am unable to get the full screen. I don't know why. Is it visible, Pierre, uh, the, uh, Samrat, the full screen or no? Uh, no, the full screen is not visible. Yes, it is visible. Uh, not quite. No. Uh, okay, I, I will continue without because now I yeah. tried some something uh, but it's it's while. it's 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 visible enough like it's it's fine like yeah, this. yeah okay fine uh good afternoon and good morning to the european uh, participants uh, i'm uh, vivek dam i'm an advisor at the research and innovation section at the eu delegation so in uh, next 15 20 minutes i will uh, take uh, you uh, the modalities of uh, application and terms and conditions and eligibility conditions but uh, prior to that, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for uh, proactively participating in this uh, brokerage event. It uh, means a lot to us. 
because your participation also uh, gives us motivation to further collaborate uh, with the indian ministries and bring the european and indian teams together so <clears throat> this is the joint presentation of uh, dbt and the eu so uh, my colleague uh, from dbt dr abhishek singh will uh, join uh, in the afternoon uh, in the closing remark uh, i think samrat i have a problem with the uh, sharing the slides so can you share from your i will because... do i will do yeah, yeah. hold on yeah hold on I'm just uh, just give me one second or so okay i'm just opening the slides Okay, it should it should be on the Vivek ji. Yeah, perfect. So next slide, please. One second, I'm just trying to put it on uh, slide mode. Um, is it now okay, Vivek ji? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So this is the content of my presentation. So I will quickly go through. Uh, different aspects of um, application uh, that is the uh, eligibility conditions application submission process evaluation process and how to find the partners different tools available uh, next slide please so this is the the uh, the call um, and the uh, deadlines of the call basically the in uh, horizon europe all the calls are uh, identified in number so if you have to search any information related to this particular call it which is much easy if you use the uh, topic identification uh, number which is quite uh, easily uh, you know uh, provide the information in google as well as in the horizon uh, participant portal as well so this is a research and innovation action that means 100% funding for the european uh, entities are uh, uh, assured uh, this is a single stage, so complete uh, proposal is required to submit uh, uh, at the time of uh, submission that is on 11th of April 2024 is the deadline. And as Pierrek already mentioned, the, the total uh, commitment from the EC for this particular call is 40 million euros. So we believe that the call, the proposal could be in the range of uh, 5 to 7 uh, uh, million euros uh, could be appropriate but it is not an uh, mandatory you can have a less or you can have more budget as per the requirement this is just an um, a tentative amount which we project but uh, feel free to to um, uh, prepare your budget as per the requirement from the government of india that is specifically dbt side as per the requirement of the uh, project that is what uh, they mentioned and they will be paying the grants in indian uh, rupees uh, next slide please So where to find the call? That is very important because you will find a lot of information about the Horizon call, entire, uh, you know, uh, Google search, uh, social media, everywhere. So, but my request to all research partners and the participant that any information related to the call should be referred only and through the funder and tender portal website. So this is your keyword funding and tender portal you just google out and you will find it and this is the only site where all the updates all the specifics of the calls and the valid um, documents are available so don't take it from any other source only through the funding and tender source i had given the arrow in the corner which also very important because on time and again the commissions gives uh, various updates about the 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 calls uh, the participation countries so all this information is available only on this particular website and this should be referred if you uh, for, go to the specific website and the specific call there is also uh, two or uh, three sections one is on the documentation so you will find all valid authentic documentation that is required for the submission of the proposals and also very importantly there is a partner search expressions tool is also available below the call so you will see a lot of people had already expressed the interest so there are two categories of people who are expressing the interest there are people who had 
project ideas and there are people who are ready to offer their expertise so those who are interested they can also uh, put your expression of interest in on the portal uh, which is specific to this particular call so that the europeans and other international partners can uh, uh, easily locate your expression so this is one of the best way to 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 uh, uh, make yourself visible uh, next slide please where uh, <clears throat> so the dbt also had um, pre uh, published a very comprehensive exclusive um, guidelines for indian participants they also have a cross link of this particular um, uh, call to the funding and to uh, tender portal so please go through the dbt websites for the indian participants who wants to know about the uh, application process the modalities and the eligibility cost uh, next slide please so who can participate uh, in this particular uh, program uh, so basically anyone across the world because the horizon is by default is open to the world uh, but almost all the countries uh, in uh, uh, entire world can participate so entities specifically uh, those who has a capacity to deliver on research and innovation action it could be university it could be research institute it could be sme company startup any organization who has a capacity and skills to address the challenge provided um, uh, put forward by the funders are eligible to be participate in this uh, program or the project proposal or consortium formation similarly the government of india had also uh, agreed um, that the central and state uh, funded organizations it could be public or private academic or research institute are eligible to participate national and state funded r and d labs institutions are uh, eligible uh, to participate uh, samrat could you please scroll down a little bit uh, there is a one more bullet yeah and scientific r and d performing industry it could be pharma industry it could be any industry if you think is interested in this particular call can participate voluntarily yeah thank you next slide please so horizon europe um, proposal eligibility um, this is very important because i i may spend a uh, couple of minutes on this because this is a call of a european union uh, basically this is a multilateral multinational uh, program so the european commission had put a very specific conditions this is uh, has to make a very distinction between bilateral call and multilateral call this is a multilateral um, uh, entity call so you need to have at least three legal entities okay from three different european member state or associated country out of that one country has to be from the member state and two could be from member state or associated countries okay i will i will elaborate again and again in my next slides so uh, just make sure that when you are uh, preparing a proposal you need to have three different entities from three different european countries that is the eligibility criteria to um, pass your administ uh, and administrability uh, of the proposal next slide please so uh, these are the the countries which i already mentioned there are 27 european state uh, member states so they are eligible automatically for um, horizon eu EU funding and entities involved in these countries are automatically funded plus there are 17 plus 2 that is uh, almost 19 countries are associated with the european program okay so recently the united kingdom that is uk is also um, uh, had Uh, agreed and it will be part of horizon uh, program uh, from 1st of january 2024 so by default they uh, you can add them uh, into the consortium as an eligible partner uh, so other countries with whom the india has a very strong collaborations like uh, um, norway uh, as well as israel so these are very uh, you know comprehensive list of countries with whom you can find different partners and different Uh, entities uh, and you can have a multilateral multinational uh, proposal and uh, next slide please so i'm going to leave these slides with a link with you so that you can access all the information so the indian eligibility basically um, 
the number of indian uh, participation is not an eligibility criteria for this horizon uh, call but if you have to um, uh, be eligible for the dbt funding you need to have one or more uh, indian uh, entities to be part of the consortium so more than one entities is highly encouraged so out of that one has to be a public institution so that is mandatory requirement so if you look at the how your consortium could look like a basic consortium it has to have a three european member states uh, or associated country uh, partners one or more uh, indian partners and you can have more partners from non european countries there are i will come to that 120 countries are automatically also funded by uh, the um, european commission plus the us which has nih uh, agreement can be also automatically funded uh, on any health co related call so please check additional eligibility uh, conditions in the uh, the call text next slide please so as i mentioned who is eligible for funding 27 member state any entities it could be research institute university sme industry ngo foundation any time who has a capability to answer the call or has the skills to deliver on the challenge uh, you had faced so those are eligible plus 19 uh, associated countries which i already showed it uh, presented to you plus there are 120 low and middle income countries are automatically funded by european commission okay but there is a group of uh, uh, countries uh, almost like a group of 11 countries uh, or 13 countries which are considered as an higher economy or emerging economy uh, next slide please i will give you the the list so so it those countries are us canada australia new zealand japan korea uh, so india brazil uh, mexico these are all uh, you know higher economy uh, countries those ent entities european commission is not co funding so what we had uh, agreed with the government of india that the co funding arrangements has been made with uh, different uh, ministries uh, for example dst dbt and ministry of earth science and the dbt had agreed to co fund the indian entities successful in this particular call so the co funding is in place so if you are selected it is assured that the government of india will co fund your uh, participation next slide please so who is eligible for the, the dbt funding uh, so basically as i already mentioned it could be public or private academic institutions university research institutional national or state labs so any entity who uh, are having a research capacity can participate and eligible for e um, um, dbt funding make sure that you have public finance management system P pfms system in place without that the dbt will not able to release the funds you will not get um, the uh, fund release on time so make sure uh, with your administration that that pfms system is in place Uh, most national institutions and universities do have but just to be on a safer side if you are a new partner into the program or participant so please uh, uh, verify with that and this specific um, funding is limited only to public and private academic and uh, research institution the industry the dbt is not going to fund so and the industry participation is encouraged but they have to bring their own resource of funding uh, so that is very much clear in the their guidelines next slide please so what is funded uh, by the government of india that is specifically dbt is very classical r and d project funding uh, so 100% uh, grant in aid uh, the indian uh, contribution that is dbt is contribute uh, uh, contribution to the specific indian entities as per the requirement of the project so you have to make sure how much uh, budget you want to execute your part of uh, work uh, in the consortium the eligibility is very straightforward it could be manpower consumable travels or heads so this is uh, these are very standard eligibility cost uh, next slide please so uh, administrability that is very important um, aspect you need to uh, pay attention all the submissions for this particular call has to be electronic electronic submission on the funding and tender portal is mandatory no paper submission 
uh, for, for the the forms which I already mentioned are already available only on this funding and tender portal should be used. No other forms uh, from the internet should be downloaded. Uh, this is specifically for the European participants basically and the application uh, annexes are available on the DBT website. I will come to that part and you will have um, part A and part B. Part B is more like a template to write and research proposal. So this entire proposal should not exceed more than 45 pages. So this information is well defined and uh, well mentioned within the uh, guidelines of the Horizon uh, proposal. But uh, more than that, the European coordinators are much more aware of this uh, administrability criteria. So uh, you just feed in your information. The European coordinators job is to put forward the proposal in uh, proper formats and the eligibility condition uh, uh, defined by European Commission. Next slide, please. So uh, general government of India co-funding, as I mentioned, the proposal, um, uh, the web notice terms and conditions has to be followed what the government of India, that is DBT, had already mentioned on their website. Proposal not submitted to both the funding agencies are disqualified. So make sure when you submit the proposal, the European partner will, sub co coordinator will submit the horizon proposal at the uh, funding and tender portal. Same copy of the proposal should be given to the lead scientific coordinator or the PI so that the same proposal to be submitted to DBT uh, after seven days lag. I will come to that point. So the, um, the proposal positively evaluated by both the agencies will be um, called for um, uh, the <clears throat> final grant agreement. The, Europe, the Indians will not sign the European uh, Commission's grant agreement because the DBT is funding them. So you will be participating as an associated partner. Okay, please remember associated partner. So the duration of the project proposal could be three to four years as per the uh, requirement of the consortium. Next slide, please. So, so again, I, I may repeat the uh, general... Uh, administrability condition joint the proposal has to be jointly developed by the european uh, participants indian participant and other uh, participants uh, from different countries make sure your information is in proper format that is they have uh, two parts part a and b um, i will not repeat those things again make sure when the european coordinator submit the proposal on funding and tender portal you have seven days um, time after the submission to Horizon, seven days time to submit the same identical proposal with the financial annexes of DBTs through email. So this is to be followed because if only proposal submitted to the Indians uh, will not be considered by commissions or the commissions only submitted to the commission will not be considered by DBT. Please, uh, next slide, please. So submission process, as I mentioned, the first submission is on funding and tender portal by the European coordinator uh, in a proper format. The same identical, uh, could you please uh, scroll down a little bit? Yeah. So the uh, Indian uh, uh, principal scientific investigator or scientific coordinator from the Indian side, if there are more than one entity, will submit the proposal to DBT that is part A and part B, which is submitted to the European Commission and plus the financial annexes in Government of India's format. Please go through those annexes uh, quite uh, carefully. And here is the email address which you need to send your proposals uh, through email. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, what uh, Pierre was emphasizing um, in his introductory uh, remark that to find a partner is very challenging. Okay, It is not an easy job specifically in a multilateral uh, program because these are big consortiums. So that is why um, the brokerage events are organized. So the brokerage events gives you an opportunity to make yourself visible to different um, uh, research consortiums, partners. And we also share the slides. But we count more than any um, platform or um, uh, virtual uh, you know, uh, matchmaking uh, events, we always recommend people that use your bilateral connections with whom you had already scientific collaborations in European teams. Because this is all about 
a trusted relationship those who had already in a bilateral call has much easy to get into this from bilateral to multilateral program so my first advice for you to go for your trusted european partners ask them if they are preparing a proposal in this particular call if they are preparing a proposal whether you can can be a part of that apart from that there are several ncps networks are available the regional offices are available so at the end of the day because you are the one who is driving the proposal uh, and having the skills so you need to find the partners on your own so these are only the platforms uh, which are facilitating your uh, communication or bringing more visibility to the people okay that is what we can maximum do but at the end of the day it is you who will find the partners of the europeans uh, will come to you so make sure this initiative has been started immediately because it takes a lot of time to find a good trusted partners and then only you can enter into a consortium formation next slide please so consortium formation i will repeat again it is three legal entities from three different european uh european countries uh, and out of that one should be from the member states additional legal uh, uh, entities from europe can be uh, added on an average when we see european uh, project uh, for example vaccine on an average we have 8 to 15 uh, participants from europe and india so these are big consortiums because the funding is substantial so because the challenge is also quite difficult so you we need a multidisciplinary cross sectoral inter um, uh, cross border participation to solve the problems as early as possible so more than the uh, the the diversity of the um, uh, consortium we are also looking into the speedy results how we can uh, uh, fast accumulate or get the deliverables and the uh, so the challenges what the society is facing uh, next slide please so one one uh, has one project coordinator from europe and one uh, uh, lead pi has to be identified from india to communicate with the dbt so uh, i will spend a minute on this specific slide because we in past we had a very uh, difficult uh, situation specifically with the indian consortiums because the these are calls which are related to health so you need to pay a lot of attention on regulatory and ethical considerations please go through the dbt's guidelines very carefully because it takes uh, a lot of time to get the approvals so as and when you get an intimation that your proposal is positively evaluated make sure you start the process of uh, regulatory and ethical clearance well in advance so that you you can start the project well in time with the european uh, partners so make sure you are well acquainted aware of this um, ethical and regulatory uh, aspects in advance before you enter even into the uh consortium uh, preparation next slide please so uh, again the one more uh, important aspects because these are again very um, uh, applicable um, application oriented uh, calls and pharma industries could be of interest to this clinical trials are involved so a lot of know how background information is coming into this uh, specific uh, consortium so we urge not only the europeans but indian partners to be aware of the ipr ownership protection user rights this is something which you need to start from the day one even you are discussing with the partners make sure you take care of all this information neither the commission nor the dbt is ownership asking an ownership the ownership remains with the uh, pi so make sure all this information are uh, you are well uh, read and acquainted with this so that you enter in a consortium agreement with the full protections and uh, full rights of your knowledge and management uh, capacity next slide please so application form i will not repeat this is part a something very uh, structured form on the website but i urge the indians not to go into this uh, because then you will find it very complex i urge the Uh, that you pass this um, application submission and data entering process to the consortium coordinator because they are much more aware of this uh, entire process than the indians so you will be more concentrating on the scientific part but also you need to give a feedback 
uh, on time and again what kind of information the coordinator needs to complete your uh, legal entity aspects uh, next slide uh, please samrat next slide please yeah so um, i will again uh, the indian participants will be part of this consortium as an associated partner because you are not signing a grant agreement of european commission okay so you will be considered as an associated partner make sure when you are discussing with the european uh, consortium members or entities from the day when you make sure that your participation is considered as an associated partner next slide please so again i am repeating the same thing but uh, when you will be entering into this particular um, funding and tender portal you will be asked participation uh, participant identification code that is pic number it is mandatory and lot of indian institutions already have it but it is quite easy to get it uh, i i am sharing the link how to get the pic number if your organization is not registered on horizon uh, europe uh, participant portal uh, funding portal so that is mandatory requirement and it is easily done uh, and there are a lot of guidelines available next slide please so uh, here as i mentioned you will be participating as an associated partner the indian entities don't have to give the budget detail you need to give only the lump sum amount which you need to execute your Uh, work in uh, indian uh, uh, you are asking the indian uh, uh, funding agency so here you will give your um, uh, amount the total amount of indian participation in euros to the coordinator so the, the coordinator will fill up this uh, budget form this information is very important for the evaluators because then they will understand how much money has been requested to execute this uh, um, kind of work uh, next slide please so evaluation will be done first by the european commission by its evaluation uh, criteria on uh, excellent excellence impact and uh, implementation uh, the followed by the dbt will also do a parallel a light evaluation uh, based on similar criteria so the proposals positively evaluated by both the um, agencies will be co-funded by the dbt uh, next slide so the timeline on an average the, i think uh, you have more than 3 uh, uh, months time for this uh, closure of the call so this is the proposal opening but normally the proposal text is open uh, quite in uh, advance uh, we takes almost 5 uh, months for evaluation and the grant agreement so the entire process from submission to the grant agreement on a legal basis we are supposed to finish within 8 months we anticipate that on month 9 the projects to be started so on the same line the government of india has agreed that they will also follow the similar timeline so that both the indian and european teams can start the project on time uh, next slide please so all this information about the platforms and these are the some uh, web links i am going to share but uh, it is already available with the your access websites as well uh, next slide please so uh, this is what the uh, pick number information here i will i am going to share you the 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 link so that uh, those entities are not registered can easily register themselves uh, all the information is also available on the net uh, next slide please so this is the pick number uh, go go down please uh, there is also a comprehensive uh, uh you know how to, if you are already check uh, registered or not you can also verify so i'm not going to go into the details uh, last slide please so if you are you, you if you are not going to put the proposal uh, in um, horizon uh, specifically for this call anything we urge indian experts to be an expert evaluators in the european commission uh, board so we we need a lot of uh, experts across the world so if you think you have capacity skills and knowledge to evaluate such a big uh, uh, proposals uh, you please register with the european commission database of evaluator it is done randomly we are not part of the evaluation it is done by the independent agency but if you are selected as an evaluator 
you will not only be acknowledged only by your skills and knowledge but also uh, european commissions pay for your uh, you know expertise uh, quite substantially uh, on an average per evaluation commission pay 3 to 4000 euros uh, uh, per um, individual so it is quite an uh, uh, way to also understand how the european commission program works uh, so i urge the people to be part of this our database uh, it, you may get a chance uh, to be invited as an uh, expert evaluator. So I think I will stop it here. Uh, in summary, uh, this is what the teams uh, are from our side, from the EU and the DBT side. So recently, Dr. Manish Rana has uh, been uh, transferred by Dr. Dhananjay Tiwari, who will take over uh, to the international DBT next week. And uh, a colleague from uh, DBT, Dr. Um, Abhish Abhishek uh, Singh, will be the nodal point uh, for the Indian side to know about the modalities of uh, uh, DBT. So please go down. And at the end of the uh, my talk, I will also uh, say that your visibility is most important underlining factor because unless and until you are visible to the Europeans, they are not going to know how who uh, they want to be uh, include into the consortium. So your visibility, your expertise should be uh, known to the other side so that they can also approach you quite easily. I will stop it here. And if you have any technical uh, difficulties, we will be more than happy to help you out. Uh, thank you, Samrat. Thank you so much, uh, Vivekji, for uh, this very insightful uh, and very clear structured presentation. Um, it's, of course, a very technical call, but um, I think you know the slides which uh, Vivek has uh, been showing to you will be made available. So you can go back and and and, and check them and, and find all the useful links which he has also shared uh, on his presentation. Uh, we go next uh, to uh, the scope of this call, which uh, will be presented by Dr. Srini Kaveri, who is the director of the CNRS office here in India, uh, based at the French embassy in India. And uh, very good morning, afternoon, Srini. Where are you right now? Afternoon. Make afternoon. afternoon. Okay, means you are you are you are in the same geographical same time region. zone. Same time zone. Yeah. That's that's great to hear. Yeah. Shrini, thank yeah. you so much for for joining, taking the time, uh, you know, yeah. to present the scope of the call to to the participants. Yeah. Um, um, we really appreciate uh, your effort and time for that. And please, uh, uh, start sharing your screen. Yeah. Do you see the full screen? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samrat, and uh, thanks also to my uh, EU colleagues, uh, Pierrick, Vivek, and others. Um, I'm delighted to uh, spend some time with you this afternoon to go over the scope of this particular call and what makes me eligible to discuss the scope of this particular call. That's because um, basically I am a CNRS scientist. Uh, for those who have not heard of CNRS, CNRS is a, a, a very large and prestigious research organization from France. And uh, CNRS covers practically all branches of science. Uh, but for the last three decades or so, I have been working as a CNRS scientist in an INSERM lab. And INSERM is equivalent of ICMR uh, in India. And my lab uh, has been working on immunology, uh, immunopathology, and immunotherapy. And thanks to this uh, expertise and knowledge in my team and my colleagues particularly, uh, we have uh, you know, some experience with the European Union. And uh, incidentally, we are also right now partners of another European call, which is uh, the, the work is already going on. And that was under the Horizon 2020. And that call is about the flu vaccines. And Jagdish Pairi, in particular, in my research team in Paris, uh, he and uh, Sebastian are involved in that. And uh, this is in my, this is this what makes me, I think this is what makes my team eligible to discuss about this. And um, I have studied uh, the scope of this particular call. So I'll walk you through this over the next 15, 20 minutes or so. And if we have questions, uh, we will take them along with Samrat, Vivek, and others. So um, my name is Srini Kaveri, as I said. 
And uh, so I'll walk you through this Horizon Health 2024 uh, Disease 0820. Uh, please take a note of this because there are quite a few calls uh, that are coming up. Uh, and uh, the, this particular call is on the pandemic preparedness and response with a special emphasis on the host pathogen interactions of infectious diseases with uh, epidemic uh, potential. And within this particular call, uh, there are several clusters, but today we are going to focus on one particular cluster and that is health cluster. And within the health cluster again, there are several, actually six uh, destinations uh, discussing various aspects of health. And uh, of course, you know, when you talk of health, it's not just the host pathogen interaction or uh, one, one particular aspect. Health is, is a very wide, it has a wide spectrum of uh, uh, activity. Uh, and therefore, there are quite a few uh, ways of looking at health. And this call that we are talking about this afternoon, uh, is it relates to one of those destinations of the six there. And the destination is called destination number three, in which we will be addressing mostly tackling diseases and how to reduce the disease burden. And as you may know, the last century has witnessed dramatic changes as far as the path, you know, the infectious diseases are concerned. In the very beginning of the last century, we did not even have antibiotics and we only had the antibodies had just begun because the antibodies were discovered in 1892. As you all know, the passive immunotherapy came and as the century evolved, the immunotherapy became more and more important. The vaccines became more and more important. And there were vaccines against several infectious diseases. We thought we are going to conquer the diseases. And then came the antibiotics, which was a good news. But as the uh, century progressed, we used, we overused, we abused antibiotics. And you know what has happened. And with the result, if you draw a, a map of the world, you, you can see that wherever people have used or abused antibiotics and also elsewhere too, there has been a big, huge problem of uh, antimicrobial resistance. We'll not go into those details now, but what is important for us to know today is that both communicable, that is infectious diseases, and non-communicable diseases have become the greatest you know, uh, reasons for premature death and disability in the European Union and worldwide. Therefore, this particular destination uh, you know, addresses an urgent need for the research and innovation to develop new preven prevention measures that could include uh, public health interventions, diagnostics, vaccines, therapies, antimicrobials, or alternatives, as well as to improve the existing strategies to create a tangible impact, taking into account the sex and gender related issues. So, as you can see, it's quite large. And I saw in the question and answer panel on the right side some time back, oh, I'm working on this, am I eligible? I'm working on vaccines or I'm working on this. Take a look at this, you take your judgment, you make your judgment. But the key strategic orientation should be creating a more resilient and inclusive and democratic society, European society you're talking about, because it's a European call. So. Essentially, the impact areas are good health and high quality, accessible health care for all. Resilience, European Union, prepared for emerging threats. And uh, of course, when you're talking about health, climate change mitigation and adaptation has to be considered. High quality digital services for all. So I know this next slide is a particularly crowded slide, but I will not go into the details. What do we expect at the end of this particular project? We expect that the health burden of diseases in the European Union and the worldwide is reduced. We expect that the premature mortality from non-communicable diseases is reduced by one third by 2030. Mental health and well-being is promoted. I'll not go into the details, but then, you, you know, as uh, my friend Vivek said, we will leave these slides with you. Take a look at that. Take your time and you, you will, you know, you will see how you fit in this. Healthcare system should benefit from the strengthened research and innovation expertise. That's what you are bringing in. Human capacities and know-how for combating 
communicable and non-communicable diseases uh, through international cooperation. I'll be talking a little bit more about international cooperation in a few minutes. Citizens should benefit from reduced or cross-border health threat of epidemia, epidemics and uh, AMR pathogens, not only in the European and all the worldwide. And the patients and citizens should become knowledgeable of disease threats. And it should go beyond just the, the patient and the doctor. It should go to the entire citizen. Uh, and this should involve and empower to the patients and citizens should be empowered to make you know, the, the decisions for their health and to adhere uh, knowledge-based disease management. Um, this particular slide was shown uh, by Vivek also, I insist. Please take a look at the label and the, the, the model is a single stage. When we say single stage, uh, some of those people who have already applied for the European Union grants may know about two stages, meaning there's a screening of some of the, the, the proposals. There's a letter of intent or a mini proposal. They're filtered out and then you go. But whereas in this case, it's one single stage. The opening date is in a couple of weeks and the closing date is on the 11th of April at 5 p.m. Eastern European time. Now, the budget, uh, once again, Vivek also has mentioned on the European side, it's in euros, it's seven to eight million per project. And uh, Pierre Cofio earlier also discussed what that means. Seven or eight may look big, but it's uh, spread over several years and on different teams. So you please consider that. However, for the Indian partners, I would, we would like you to note that this is according to the requirement of the project and it is given by the DBT and Indian rupees. So what do we expect uh, out of this? So three primary expected outcomes from this particular topic. Enhanced knowledge, meaning the researchers and healthcare professionals will gain much better insight into the viruses with epidemic potential. Specifically, we aim to uh, improve our understanding of the host pathogen interactions because we as biologists, at least most of the biologists sitting here know that this host pathogen interaction is a very critical element for developing targeted vaccines, COVID has taught us, and inhibitors of that particular host pathogen interactions to prevent the viral infections. That's first one. Second one is innovative approaches. We strive to provide the scientific and clinical communities with novel approaches for the treatment of emerging and re-emerging infections, especially in the context of epidemics and pandemic preparedness. This is the, the core, the fact, pandemic preparedness. Now, also the development pipeline, our objective will be to establish diverse and robust development for pipeline for vaccine candidates and inhibitors. And that can happen only if your basic science is good. So offering increased therapeutic uh, options for the doctors uh, for clinical deployment during epidemics, epidemics or pandemics. So once again, one more crowded slide, sorry about that. So the scope is quite large. I'm referring to the questions once again, you know, one of some of the questions were said, I'm working on this, can, am I eligible, et cetera. See, here is what it is. See, one is the ongoing threat of infectious diseases. COVID-19 pandemic has underscored a persistent and significant threat that's posed by infectious diseases all over the world. Acceleration of viral uh, disease emergence, factors such as climate change. Climate change are, are expected to accelerate. We all know that the emergence of new viral diseases and so we should keep that in mind. So we address the challenges. A proactive approach is essential, specifically focusing on the development of vaccines and inhibitors targeting uh, the cellular uptake of the viruses. This is where the host pathogen interaction comes into picture. And critical preparedness measure. The availability of vaccines and inhibitors targeting the viral uh, uh, cellular uptake is critical uh, so that it's readily available, the, the therapeutic options. All this also is mentioned in the fact sheet. We will leave this slide with you. Take a look at the particular link and then study them properly. So more, uh, a little bit more information on the scope. So the proposal should adopt innovative approaches because that was, that's what makes it. If it is not a routine or run of the mill, no. Something innovative, something novel to characterize host pathogen interactions that inhibit the viral replication. Uh, you know, you could have proteases, uh, exit strategies, or therapeutic antibodies, antibodies directed against on the, the viral components or appropriate, you know, uh, targets, epitopes that you know. And vaccines also are uh, welcome. 
the proposal should primarily focus on specific set of viruses because somebody was asking, I'm working on this particular bacteria or pathogen, am I eligible? So here are the, the viruses that could include, I mean, that doesn't exclude others. You have Hendra, Nepal, Lassa, Crimean, Congo, hemorrhagic fever, Rift Valley, Ebola, Marburg virus, uh, Dengue, yellow fever virus, uh, Zika, West Nile virus, Chikungunya. So you have a whole panel of viruses. And proposals should take into account the sex and gender aspect in their research and development efforts. So the global threat, uh, therapeutic research and EU leadership, this is to, no, Google is also to diversify and expedite the global therapeutic research and development pipeline for emerging and re-emerging viral infections. This will only help strengthen the EU, EU's prominent role in therapeutic research and development. So coming to a bit more specifics of uh, the research areas, I have been insisting, repeating about the host uh, cell receptors. The proposal should uh, focus on the identification and characterization of probably novel receptors or receptors on host cells that enable the docking and internalization of the viruses. So the emphasis should be placed on understanding the diversity of these cellular entry receptors. Maybe you will you know, discover novel receptors or you have already novel, uh, discovered some novel receptors how to characterize them further. And all the, on the other side, you know, on the, the viral side, the, you can focus your efforts uh, to include identification and characterizations of the viral surface proteins, which could be the targets, as you know, either for immunotherapy, making specific antibodies against these particular uh, surface proteins, or it could be also vaccine uh, candidate antibodies. So, and we also like to know the, a little bit of biology or mechanism of the viral uptake. Proposals should investigate the mechanism of viral uptake within the host cells with a specific focus on understanding the topology, the dynamics of the interaction between host receptors and the viral ligands. And lastly, identification of targetable receptor and ligand subunits. So here the research should aim, at, uh, aim to identify the receptor and ligand subunits that could be targeted for preventive or therapeutic intervention. See, as you can see, the, the, there's quite a wide spectrum of research area that's possible. And it's quite likely that you, you know, all of you have expertise in some of these uh, areas. There is a specific uh, guideline. This is something that's uh, interesting. I would like to uh, focus on that. Now, this is regarding the European Commission's what we call as Joint Research Center Research Infrastructure, particularly in nanobiotechnology laboratory. What do I mean by that? So we uh, make an appeal to you, we encourage you to consider the inclusion of this particular infrastructure, which is already there. The idea is if you include that, you have the basic infrastructure. This is a very sophisticated set of uh, nanobiotechnology laboratory in, in Italy, I, uh, it is, and um, that gives you the expertise in biophysical, biophysical characterization of recombinant proteins, antigens, therapeutic antibodies, and uh, GRC's capabilities at the interface between research activities and regulatory aspects. Because, you know, all of us may not be experts in the regulatory aspects. I'll come back to the regulatory aspects in, in the next slide or so. So these people are good. Why don't we uh, tap their knowledge and they would be able to help us uh, with uh, preparing uh, appropriate uh, proposal. So the collaboration with GRC should be established uh, once the proposal is approved based on relevance and mutual interest because it should interest them also, but most of them, they are open to collaborating with successful because the, the moment your proposal is accepted, which also means that it is an interesting uh, project and they know that such a project would have a relevance and therefore they will be more than willing to cooperate with you. So consider that. And applicant un intending to include the clinical studies in their proposals should provide detailed information. I'll talk about the clinical uh, study definition also in a second, using the template provided in the submission system. The definition uh, is found uh, here. I'll tell you about the definition. So whenever we talk of clinical studies, there's a specific definition, okay? Uh, if some of you are doctors and if you have clinical trials or clinical studies or investigations, 
and they are defined as any specific, uh, sorry, systematic prospect, prospective or retrospective collection and analysis of health data obtained from individual patients or healthy persons in order to address scientific questions related to the understanding, prevention, diagnosis, monitoring, or treatment of a disease, mental illness, or physical condition. I know that you know all this. I'm repeating so that you, you know, uh, if you have intention of including clinical trials, you keep this in mind. And also please read all these uh, definitions uh, uh, that are provided in this link that is shown here at the bottom of the slide. And the, the, those that include the medicinal products is a particular definition. Those that are including medical devices that have a different uh, you know, definition. And those that use the in vitro diagnostic or medical devices, there is a different regulation. So please do take a look at that because we are discussing human, you know, individuals, patients, uh, and healthy people. So these definitions should be very clearly uh, kept in mind. Please see the details here. International cooperation, extremely important. And because we all know, I mean, the very fact that we are all sitting together today, I mean, sitting, just listening to each other, uh, is because of the importance of the, the international cooperation. And um, that helps us to share the know-how and re research infrastructures. I mentioned about one in when earlier and that will align with other funders to leverage in, you know, investments for priority needs. And we can collaborate with international organizations to address the global health challenges, combat infectious diseases. And we know that. I mean, of course, you know how important it is. So in brief, um, the research importance emphasize the critical role of research in addressing uh, uh, infectious disease threats, especially endemic epidemics. Sorry, uh, a proact proactive approach. You know, come on out of the box. Stress the need for a proactive response to evolving health challenges, including the climate-induced disease emergence. You you know about it. Uh, outline the research objectives very clearly. Identifying the host cell receptors or viral proteins or uptake mechanisms that I discussed earlier, highlight the significance of targeting the receptor or the ligand subunits for the prevention and treatment of a, of a disease, and then mention the collaboration opportunities with JRC that I have discussed a bit uh, a while ago for enhanced research. And please stress on the importance of uh, you know, the clinical study. Don't leave any stone unturned there. Um, I stop here. I hope I was not too fast, but because there was a lot of substance, I went a little fast. Uh, I stopped sharing. And um, if you have questions, uh, Vivek, Samrat, and others, we will all take your questions. Uh, am I on time, Samrat, or uh, am I uh, okay? You're actually, so uh, yes, you made it in time, Shini. Thank you so much. It was a really great uh, presentation and uh, very well explained. And we have now the opportunity to uh, get some questions across to Dr. Srini Kaveri and Dr. Vivek. So I kindly ask, uh, you know, the um, uh, attendees, uh, also the uh, presenters today, if you want to know something now, you know, you can either put it in the Q&A chat, or you have the option also to, you know, raise your hand and we'll give you the opportunity to speak directly to, to the presenters. Uh, let's see what we have in the Q&A. There's, uh, um, there's one question about what is the scope of wastewater-based epidemi epidemiological surveillance in this call? Is there any kind of scope on, on wastewater? Vivek, you want to take that? Yeah, basically what Srini had uh, mentioned, the the viruses, uh, the list has already been uh, covered in the, the call text. So um, we urge the people to stick to the call scope, uh, which is defined, well defined uh, on the funding and tender portal. So I, I don't want to decode. It is up to the wisdom of the scientists to, to see if how relevant uh, it is uh, in the given challenge. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's a question about uh, U.S. entities from the U.S. Are they allowed into the call? Yeah, yeah actually by default because NIH has an uh, 
comprehensive um, understanding and agreement with the EU. So it happens seamlessly. So all the US entities, uh, specifically in health sector only, are automatically funded by uh, NIH and uh, EU agreement. So you can include the US entities in it. Mm -hmm. Another question is, also is, about... mentioned, is also mentioned in the call document as well in the eligibility conditions. If someone look at the work program uh, of health, it quite explicitly mentioned that the US entities are part of uh, eligible to be part of the call. Okay. Uh, question about what pathogens are included in the scope of the call. Is it only emerging pathogens or we can look at the relation between bovine and human TB? Rini, can you? As uh, Vivek said, um, you know, we we are not supposed to decode what they have, you know, what the European Union has intended to do this. The viruses have been clearly listed. So we encourage the scientists uh, to, to stick to that because, you know, this is something that, you know, we are not entitled to, or we cannot uh, start decoding and deciphering what they mean by that. So it's difficult to answer that question. Vivek, you want to add something? No? Okay. Um, is this project the call only for viruses or also for other, like other parasites? Or, um... yeah, I guess the same. I'm sorry, same yeah. answer. Uh, the list of viruses is, uh, is given by the European Union. And mm -hmm. so we cannot go beyond that as far as, uh, you know, deciphering that what they want the European Union. So uh, the scope is rather clear from their announcement. Okay. We have, uh, a hand raised here by uh, Shahira Ahmed. Um, you could unmute yourself and pose your question, please. Oh, I, I maybe it's a mistake. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. My name is, I'm Professor Karanis from Germany and uh, from uh, Cyprus and uh, I'm interested in collaborations uh, in emerging pathogens with parasites. So because we focus mainly on parasites and this is the question because I came a little bit late to the, um, uh, to the presentation and I show that you focus, Dr. Kaveri focused uh, on the viruses. Uh, but I, I, I hypothesize, I assume that it's also, also for bacteria and, and uh, parasites which are uh, emerging pathogens and I am interested for the parasites in the field of the parasites. And I forgot to suggest to submit my idea because it was so full week and I wanted to, to distribute, to disseminate my project idea. The question is now, can I submit this later? Can we come to the contact? Because it's um, about uh, specifically about cryptosporidium, which is um, uh, very interesting also for, for India. I don't have Indian collaboration to this moment but we can uh, create in the future uh, a, also in this project inside of this uh, horizon. It's very mature. The idea is very mature to, to, um, to realize. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you have some uh, feedback and response and uh, also scientists, they want to establish this kind of research, I, will, I would be very lucky to, um, to cooperate with you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor. Actually, uh... Uh, we will appreciate if you leave your contact details in the in the chat so that the people can also um, connect you. And regarding the, the questions the people are asking, whether the virus, bacteria, or parasite, yes. uh, if you think it is nearby or it is part of that, just uh, drop a line. We will ask the um, um, you know, concern uh, uh, topic uh, experts uh, uh, more details. Uh, just drop mm. a line. Uh, Samrat's mm. email is with you. He will forward to us and uh, 
uh, we will uh, cross verify but also i urge the people there is a specific uh, q and a also on this particular topic on the for, uh, horizon portal so you can mm. also refer and mm. after this event we will also have uh, we have a recording of a uh, uh, info day which happened uh, last m uh, month uh, in brussels so there uh, they also discuss explicitly so we will also share the link of that particular um, uh, webinar so that the, you can go through quickly uh, the questions and answers which are posed uh, whether that uh, answers your idea or the question otherwise you write to us thank you very much thank you yeah Furthermore, you know, there are quite a few bilateral mechanisms also you may want to keep in mind, you know, that that's beyond uh, European Union. There are quite a few mechanisms that would help you. So stay in touch with the scientists in India and see what they're doing and then there are ways of establishing. Okay. Samrat, yes. maybe a professor can send a slide to you with his contact details and, sure, topic sure. and yeah. uh, expertise you are expecting so that we can display on the uh, your access website and circulate in the network so that... Uh, the people can easily approach you, uh, Professor. Yeah, yeah, this is a good idea. Yeah, because we are world vi uh, world leaders in this idea, and uh, I always uh, wanted to be in connection with it. Yeah, the time is coming now. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. So, very mm. thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. We we would very much appreciate if you could send us your uh, contact details and slides, and we're happy to disseminate it with all the participants. And hopefully, you know, you could uh, get some nice. Uh, Good fruitful mm. collaboration through that. I, I, I also... put the email in in the in the chat, but I don't know if uh, this uh, reach you. But uh, maybe I will send this yeah. uh, address you put here. Uh, yeah, India, I'm, I'm... your access. Yeah, please share it there with us. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, we okay. also have uh, Anshal Chandra who would like to uh, ask something, and also Dr. Rahul Roy has raised his hand. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to ask. So you talked about that. Mostly, this will be to fund uh... I think we just lost her. Sorry, uh, Anchal ji, can, can you? Yes. Can yeah, you sorry. Me? Yeah, with no, also some tech please. technical glitch. Could you repeat? Okay. Yeah, sure. So I was asking, can you apply if you are, let's say, developing a technology platform, for example, nanobodies or single domain proteins, which can be used to develop more eff effective and efficient uh, targets or for diagnostic purposes for viruses. So if it is not a basic research program, but it is more of a technology platform that can be applied for improved diagnostic and therapeutics development. So will such kind of projects can be applied uh, because this is not based just doing the basic research, but also uh, using the technology to develop more therapeutic and diagnostic uh, tools. So such kind of yeah. project, what is the scope for such kind of projects? Absolutely. Um, you see, if you remember what we said when we were trying to uh, uh, characterize the epitopes or the on the both the host, host and parasite, oh, sorry, host and pathogen side, but viral epitopes, etc. If you think that you have the technology, that can address uh, uh, making nanobodies or specific antibodies or CO2 fragments, which are very specific for some of these viral components, which are viral proteins, which are important in the host pathogen, host uh, pathogen interactions, host viral interactions, then please keep an eye on the global picture of the consortia that are being formed. And if you think that your expertise can address one particular issue of generating either antibodies or inhibitors, you are perfectly there. You are there. You have your place there. Okay. I have just related question regarding that. So let's say, uh, so if we bring in like our expertise of, you know, nanobody discovery platform and protein bioengineering, but then the partners that we are looking for. So do we have to bring partners who can bring in more clinical uh, aspects so, so that, you know, or from different aspects or they can be all from the same sort of, uh, what do you call background or... Or they have to it depends. Different... It depends. It depends on the objectives that you are setting. I mean, the whole consortia. You are not individual, right? Yeah. There is uh, quite a few people from the European side, and you are quite a few people. So overall, the global picture. You will be fitting in with your expertise to answer some of the 
main questions the main questions are important and you will come with your expertise you do not worry at this stage whether there should be a clinician or no clinician whether clinical trial should be there but if it has to you know if the person who the main person who is building the project thinks that uh, he or she needs a clinical partner they will they will look for that but your expertise you propose your expertise but addressing a particular question it should be specific to the objective okay yeah thank you you do not worry about the clinical i mean if the clinical relevance is there and clinical uh, studies or investigations are a must for this project then the principal coordinator will consider that we'll talk to them and we'll include the clinical partners you you, you do not have to worry okay yeah thank you Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahul Roy. You had raised your hand. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I had two quick questions. One is um, about uh, whether Eurexis has a kind of a database specifically for this particular call, where they have been generating interest from uh, European researchers who are interested in participating in the call, building a team and would like to look for uh, partners outside of EU. Uh, that will be very, very useful. The second uh, is a question to Dr. Tham about this uh, so-called guarantee that they have got about uh, DBT participating and maintaining the same timeline for release of funds and so on. Um, what kind of house strong is that um, uh, guarantee uh, in, in what regard that guarantee is, uh, is something that I would like to understand. Uh, when does DBD decide uh, that what kind of money it is uh, going to pitch in and how it is going to pitch in? Uh, is there a budget that has, I, I think it's probably a question for DBD, but I, I wonder if uh, Dr. Tham knew something about this. Thank you. Okay, so I take, um... The question related to guarantee, basically this is an understanding between the two governments. So we anticipate that uh, the agreements or the, uh, the commitment made by, it is a government level uh, uh, commitment. So most of our past projects did um, follow the timelines. Uh, there are technical glitches and financial, but uh, on an average, we um, fairly had a good uh, track record uh, as far as the EU is concerned, because these are mega projects. So. Uh, they underlines the importance of timely grant agreement uh, signing. And what was your uh, uh, the evaluation? Basically, uh, see the once the proposal is evaluated positively by the European Commission, also the DBT also has its own evaluation, and they uh, exchange the information quite timely because we had a uh, mechanism already established within the intergovernmental. Uh, uh, mechanism so we share the data and informations with each other specifically for the the um, successful uh, project so we anticipate that it is uh, flawless but you cannot guarantee of anything because it is an uh, you know intergovernmental agreement and there are so many uh, administrative formalities because more than the the funding a lot of uh, time we uh, find the difficulties of the uh, ethical clearance uh, opening is quite a time consuming uh, process so we uh, advise people to be very vigilant about the the clearances uh, and the formats which you submit. And I also advise a lot of people because uh, the Indian side, because we are an observers, uh, tend to uh, ask more money uh, than what is required. Sometimes it's not justifiable. So again, it goes back to our negotiations and all these details. So I urge uh, what exactly the realistic budget is proposed then it is much more easy for the funders to go fast into the grant agreement. And I think and, Rahul also go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and regarding the 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 um, partner search, um, um, partners. Uh, you know, tools and everything. So if I can share, and I hope my slide, uh, this uh, screen will be visible, uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you confirm? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Samrat, is it visible? Yes. Okay. yes. Yes. It is visible. It's crowded, but it is visible. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm going trying to go down um, because just below the call, there is also, if you see, there is a partner search announcements uh, over here. And there are somehow my, I don't know why there is a technical problem in my system. 
so somehow uh, the um, there is an expression so, uh, if yeah yeah if you see there are 60 um, researchers already had, um, expressed their interest in the to this specific call so i can also advise you to express your interest to um, this particular call so that others can be visible and you can also communicate with them so it is also very you know focused and uh, a specific call related ex expression so my uh, advice uh, to a lot of people that uh, make yourself visible specific to this particular call i think i am clear dr rahul yes thank you so much yeah time okay uh, i think we move on now to the first flash presentations uh, so we start with um uh dr parikshit tyagi from the serum institute of india uh Dr. Tyagi, are you with us? Yeah, hi, Dr. Samrat. Uh, very good afternoon to you. Hi, yeah. good afternoon. Thank you, sir, for joining. And could you kindly share your screen and your slides? Yes, sure. And uh, just please uh, keep the time limit in mind. So we have a uh, you know, limited time today, but we have the possibility to uh, you know share your uh, context and presentations with the other participants so there will be a possibility after the webinar to to interact but uh, yeah please go ahead yeah yeah okay Professor Tiagi, just I have to unmute your mic. Hope my uh, slides are uh, visible. Yes, they are. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, all. This is uh, Parikshit Tiagi, General Manager, Serum Institute of India. So uh, I'm looking here at uh, analytical development and uh, commercial release of uh, viral vaccines ranging from older vaccines, MMR group, OPV, IPV, etc. And also the newer vaccine like COVID-19 and uh, seasonal flu and others. Serum Institute of India is, uh, let us have some brief introduction. Serum Institute of India Private Limited, world's largest vaccine manufacturer by the number of doses produced and sold. And SII, WHO pre-qualified vaccine mainly include polio, diphtheria, tetanus, hip, BCG, hepatitis B, rotavirus, influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, etc. And SII has an active research and development team with extensive scientific expertise in the field of basic research, viral vaccines manufacturing, and also to conduct uh, clinical trials, uh, even preclinical too. SII has an uh, extremely good success record in implementing collaborative projects for the development and licensure of vaccines. So uh, we have collaborated with uh, many global uh, partners, including Indian and overseas for uh, launching of the vaccines and the development part two. So here uh, we would like to give our proposal is for cell-based live attenuated influenza vaccine and our goals will be understanding immune repertoire and efficacy through human challenge studies. So the currently 
uh, we have egg-based seasonal influenza vaccine. So we wish to establish the platform for uh, cell-based vaccines because they are better systems and better scalable at the time of pandemic. And this is the answer for PIP framework. So under this project, as I would like to explore and understand the induction of mucosal, humoral and cellular immune response in human subject on intranasal uh, immunization with LAIV. And uh, we have uh, produced those uh, cell-based LAIV for seasonal as well as for pandemic strains like uh, H5, H7, etc. And there we would like to, to explore these studies as a part of uh, pandemic preparedness uh, on this cell-based platform and a study vaccine efficacy of live vaccine in human challenge studies and uh, this live attenuated influenza vaccine safety and efficacy of LAIV is well established and a commercial egg-based LAIV is manufactured by Serum and we are licensed and we are also WHO pre-qualified for live attenuated vaccine for seasonal flu on egg-based platform and uh, but the availability of specific pathogen free eggs for the production of vaccine is a major limitation for egg-based vaccine and especially during pandemic when sudden demand of the vaccine increased exponentially so getting the eggs is a very difficult task getting the eggs their planning and the incubation etc it is really a huge task and that limits our capability of manufacturing and distribution of the vaccine at the time of pandemic so taking this into consideration SII has developed a cell culture based life attenuated influenza vaccine candidate vaccine and uh, we have already done safety and efficacy of this vaccine and which is established in ferrets and uh, we have already published that data and the 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 efficacy in ferrets the data is uh, very good and they are very much comparable with the egg based vaccines in terms of uh, immunogenicity and uh, safety so we are looking for uh, consortium partners uh, for the following we wish to conduct phase one clinical trial of laiv using candidate pandemic strains of h5 and h7 under control condition of course to establish the vaccine safety and to conduct human challenge studies using seasonal influenza strain to establish vaccine efficacy and the uh, uh, next target will be study mucosal humoral and cellular immune response using various techniques with the aim to identify immunological markers of the protection so these are the three targets and profile partner we sort is having capacity to conduct clinical trial under control condition which is very important as you know for pandemic uh, viruses and pandemic vaccines candidates and laboratories with the experience in conducting human challenge study uh, and mainly for flu will be really helpful and laboratory with the capacity to study various immunological parameters to study the sera from the clinical trials and a few key keywords mucosal response humoral cellular response human challenge etc and uh, we would be contacting uh, though dr lena yevlikar should present this proposal but she is busy today so her details are here for this proposal to contact so Dr. Lina Yevlekar, uh, Serum Institute of India, 212 by 2 Hadap Sir Pune, and uh, her email address, telephone number, etc. So these are her contact details. So this is about uh, our proposal. 
So if anybody wish to ask questions related to this, and I hope I have concluded it within the time limit. Yes, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your presentation. It was all well in time and very happy that you could uh, present uh, on this webinar and looking forward you know, to hearing more about any uh, future potential collaboration on this call. Um, next, um, we would like to invite Professor uh, Shashank Tripathi uh, from the Center for Infectious Disease Research at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, joining us from Bengaluru. Uh, very good afternoon, Professor Tripathi, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sumrat. I'll quickly share my screen. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, sir. All right. So I'll get to the point directly. So uh, I'm here at the Indian Institute of Science uh, in Bangalore, which is one of the premier research and education institutions in India, uh, with wide range of expertise of scientists. But uh, here at the Center of Infectious Disease Research, where my lab is located, uh, we have been working precisely in this area, which is dealing with the pandemic and emerging viruses. And the goal of my presentation is to highlight uh, what are the resources available at this center and in my lab, which works along with the center, and uh, some overview of ongoing research uh, in my lab, uh, which fits within this uh, uh, calls uh, scope. So at Center for Infectious Disease Research, uh, there are scientists working on bacterial as well as viral pathogens. Uh, our lab works on respiratory viruses, including influenza and SARS-CoV-2, as well as flavi viruses, including dengue, Zika, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile virus, and uh, the set of pathogens is uh, continually increasing. And the model systems which we use for our research are uh, a lot of cell culture models, uh, including uh, transformed and primary cells, but uh, also we are trying to work on organoid development, especially for respiratory viruses. Uh, we have very well established, characterized, validated use animal models for uh, respiratory viruses. Uh, for flavi viruses, we are in the process of developing animal models. In this center, we have uh, established a viral BSL3 facility dedicated to uh, BSL3 category viral pathogens emerging and uh, pandemic category. Uh, we had the uh, fortune of being supported by BIRAN during the COVID-19 pandemic to convert this center into a national facility for preclinical evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, through that support, uh, we were able to run multiple projects. I'll come to that. But also, our facility was augmented. So some of the instruments, uh, high-end equipment, are placed inside the facility now, which are very useful for antiviral research. For example, we have a high-content screener inside the BSL-3, uh, which is very handy for running uh, antiviral uh, screening expeditions. We have a fact sorting platform inside the BSL3, which is very useful for immunological characterization, especially in the vaccine studies. Uh, we have also established a viral genomics facility, uh, which as of now has a MySeq platform, which is sufficient for viral and bacterial sequencing. And we are also in the process of setting up a histopathology core, which is very useful for conducting preclinical efficacy studies. Now, at this center in past two years, uh, we have done a lot of vaccine efficacy studies, antiviral testing studies, and material device testing, testing studies, primarily for uh, SARS-CoV-2, because that, that's what was the priority past couple of years during the pandemic. But quite a few studies have been done on flu also, and now more demand is coming for flavi viruses. Uh, I'm just listing some of the clients that we have worked with. Uh, Indian government agencies, their institutions, a lot of CSR institutions like CCMB, CMAP, IMTEC, and BARC. Uh, Indian pharma industries, uh, notably with Genova, we have worked, which is the uh, Indian company which was successfully able to launch and uh, uh, bring the COVID-19 mRNA self-amplifying vaccine to the clinic. Uh, we did the preclinical uh, evaluation of their candidate. We did evaluation of a VLP-based uh, candidate for SARS-CoV-2 for famous. And for Biominita, we did validation of a device, actually, uh, which is used for uh, sterilization of air and a couple of these projects, Genova's vaccine and Biomedica's device, they are actually in the market. 
but beyond india also we have worked with uh, several companies across the globe in canada usa singapore australia and japan and uh, we are continue to uh, engage in more and more international uh, partners industry as well as academic institutions now along with viral psl3 uh, i also have my own uh, uh, research lab uh, which is called emerging viral pathogens lab and uh, the expertise and program uh, is essentially the same which i mentioned earlier because uh, that's what is being used in viral base 32 but in my lab we also focus on virus biology virus host interactions and fundamental aspects of viral disease and uh, uh, we were also uh, part of uh, earlier horizon 2020 call on developing broadly protective flu vaccine where uh, we have a candidate based on uh, t cell immunotopes uh, uh, epitopes uh, uh, and as a co pi yeah, our studies are ongoing there and from my lab, I'll just try to uh, quickly highlight uh, two recent studies, uh, which will give you a flavor of things which are ongoing in the lab. Uh, this study published recently in Cell Reports Medicine. Here we reported uh, a broad spectrum antiviral called picolinic acid, which is a natural metabolite. And we showed that it's an entry inhibitor for pretty much uh, every enveloped virus that we tested against it. Uh, and uh, this includes respiratory viruses like flu SARS CoV 2, but also a lot of flavy viruses. Uh, which are actually part of this particular call. Uh, uh, and uh, for uh, flu and SARS-CoV-2, we went ahead and did the preclinical efficacy studies also. And now we are working in collaboration with industries to uh, do further refinement of efficacy of this molecule and try to bring it to the clinic, uh, if not in current form, at least in form of derivatives. And prior to this, uh, during pandemic uh, initial days, we did an analysis of uh, uh, all the omics data sets available for uh, COVID-19 at that time uh, from patients. And long story short, this led to identification of a prognostic signature, uh, a set of genes belonging to S100 families, which is a family of genes called alarmins. And uh, we are in the process of developing a prognostic diagnostic dual assay kit based on this information, uh, where using a nasal swab, you should be able to diagnose the patient, but also give information on disease severity status. In the same study, we also reported uh, an FDA approved drug called Oronofin, which is an anti-inflammatory drug primarily used for arthritis uh, elevation. Uh, we showed that it has the ability to directly uh, block SARS-CoV-2 replication and mitigate uh, disease in uh, Syrian hamster models. And we are currently working on using Oronofin in combination with other FDA approved antivirals, direct acting antivirals, and develop a combination therapy. So this is the kind of work which goes on, which includes cell culture models, animal models, uh, large data set analysis, and also mechanistic studies uh, as far as the antiviral research goes. But we do have a vaccine development and research program, which I'm not highlighting here, but as mentioned uh, previously in the previous NFLU consortium supported through Horizon 2020, we are working on that. And these are some of the publications which have come out uh, from our lab, helping out other labs in collaboration. Uh, some of them I uh, discussed in previous slide and uh, rest are in collaboration. So idea is to uh, put ourselves out there uh, for uh, collaborators will be interested as part of this call, but also otherwise, if anybody's interested in uh, collaborating with this, uh, for, especially for doing mode of action studies uh, or preclinical efficacy studies for vaccines and antivirals uh, for respiratory or flavi viruses will be happy to engage with you. And these are my contact details. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I am the faculty in charge for the viral BC3 facility, but also I have my lab here. And my affiliation is primarily to the microbiology and cell biology department here at Indian Institute of Science. Thank you so much, Professor Shashank, for the presentation. and. Uh... We have next on our uh, agenda, Mr. Gautam uh, Pashupuleti uh, from the Biodesign Innovation Labs, but I don't see him in the panel. So I guess he was not able to join us unless he's here. No. So then we move to the next presenter, which is Dr. Devashri from the Brilla Institute of Technology and Science, uh, Pilani from the Hyderabad campus. Uh, very good afternoon, Dr. Devashree, and thank you so much for joining. Um, the floor is yours. So very good afternoon. I will share my screen. 
Is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. You can just try to put it in full screen mode if it's possible. Otherwise, it's fine. It's it's clearly visible. You could start. Does it work? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Please. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my research idea and also uh, my idea for pre the populations and integrated on Ma'am, uh, there is an interruption. I think your voice is breaking. Maybe you could try to switch off your camera just okay. to get more, more bandwidth. Yeah. Is okay. it better now? Yeah, please go on. Okay. okay. So the presentation of the title is Development of COVID-19 Prediction Tool Based on Hematological Parameters Derived Across the Populations and Integrated on Machine Learning Platforms. The COVID-19, although it is it has subdued, but there are different variants with mild We should be prepared and ready to combat if and when it comes back. So the COVID-19 Primary detection tool is RT-PCR, but it has several limitations. First of all, it is expensive. Second, it takes a lot of time from sample collection to experiment and final the results to come, it takes a long time. So this is one of the prohibition we would say for RT-PCR test. And the more mass level test is rapid antigen test, but it is compromised with its accuracy level. Although it can be tested on a large scale and it can also be self-tested. So these are the most commonly used detection tools for COVID-19. But we are in search of a detection tool which will be accurate as well as which is fast, cheap, and efficient. Uh, that's why we moved to hematology-based predictions because all over the world, researchers have identified different hematological biomarkers which actually are very important in identifying the disease. So it could be an interesting alternate pathway, alternate prediction tool to develop based on hematological parameters. That is what we are going to do. In this presentation, I will brief about And the profile what we so here is the preliminary data what we have done so far. So what we have done, we have collected the hematology based parameters from three different demographic locations. One is Italy, the other one is Brazil and Western Europe. So we have collected the data and built the models. And in brief, our results showed that if our training, machine learning training data set is from Brazil, and if it is tested on Brazilian data set, the performance of the machine learning models the performance is not so good. So this is what we have observed from our preliminary data. But currently what we're looking for from this um, joint call from this consortium, our expected expectation from this interaction is we want to develop a machine learning model which can be used universally across the populations. Now what we have, if we train and test on the same population, the results are optimal. But our expectation is if we can develop a model which can work across all the populations. So first thing what we are looking for, we are looking for the hematology based data sets across, currently we have three which are publicly available, Italy, Brazil and West Europe. We are also in consortium with ESI hospital in Hyderabad, those who are providing us with the Indian data. 
And the next part, what we're going to do, we are going in the process of optimizing the parameters, which will work universally. And once we have these two parameters optimized, one, the data set, the other one is the optimization of different populations. Then we will train the model and make it universally applicable. So here is the current consortium, those the clinicians were providing the data from Employee State Insurance Hospital, Hyderabad. And we are looking for the partners from European countries so that it can be an universal data set and a platform which can be used all over the world. So the expectations is the hospital records for data collection and retrieval. And we need the hematological parameters and expertise from clinicians for their interpretation of the data. And finally, we want to develop, once all the data are together, we will integrate on machine learning platform. Our current work is under revision uh, in class one. So it will come up soon. And this is what we want to do, benchmark the model on machine learning and deep learning. And the contact details is given here. So that is, that's it from my side. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And uh, we move to the next uh, presenter, which is uh, Dr. Kesha Vardana Sanula, uh, a professor <laughs> at the Department of Biochemistry at the Institute of Science. Good afternoon, yeah, sir. Actually, like, hi, good afternoon, Samuel. Uh, can I share my sure. screen? Yes, please, sir. Do you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Yes, perfectly. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this uh, opportunity. And I'm Kesha, a faculty at the Department of Biochemistry at Indian Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore. So our uh, goal is uh, a bit different from others, is that we try to understand reservoir hosts like bats and birds, which actually carry many pathogenic genetic viruses like be it coronaviruses, Lisa viruses, hantaviruses, or even picanoviruses. But how, how do they manage these viruses in them without causing any disease or inflammation? But the same virus, when they jump to the humans, they cause the disease. Okay. So that's what our, our, our lab theme is, that we try to understand both reservoir hosts and uh, humans with respect to the genetic virus infections how these viruses uh, have been replicating and causing pathogenesis in both of them. And using that information, can we come back to a particular uh, a virus and both host and virus mechanisms that can be targeted therapeutically for mitigating uh, immunopathology in them? So one such uh, 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 host pathway that we are working on called uh, inflammatory cell death. Uh, this is a form of regulated cell death where a cell will uh, undergo a lytic form of cell death, which is mediated by pore forming proteins. And this kind of cell death is, have been very well observed in pulmonary infections like SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. Uh, ideally, its role is to protect the host uh, to, to destroy virus replicative niche. Uh, but in case of respiratory virus infections, uh, it has been seen that this kind of inflammatory cell death pathways are uh, aggravated or dysregulated. Uh, that's why you see uh, uh, heavy respiratory epithelial damage as well as uh, cytokine storm. So what we have found uh, recently is that we reported some of the results recently. And now we're trying to understand this. Bats have got uh, many adaptations in this particular uh, inflammatory cell death machinery. Uh, so unlike humans, they activate a suboptimal response of inflammatory cell death so that they can tolerate viruses with causing very mild inflammation instead of causing uh, induced cytokine storm responses. So one such protein is a gas termin D protein. Like I said here in the previous slide, I was trying to show that this protein forms spores on the membrane. This leads to the leaky environment in the virus infected cells. That's leading to the secretion of cytokines and also lytic form of cell death. Okay. 
But what we have seen is that bats have got uh, interesting mutations in them that lead to the abrupt uh, disruption of pore structure formation in them. Now, not only we have the modeling studies, now we have uh, experimental evidence studies in case of virus infections. The bat, uh, inf bat gastrolimin D proteins tend to reduce the inflammation that is induced by viruses. So based on this, we're trying to understand, uh, can we target uh, this pyroptosis pathway, especially that we have seen in bats that it is important to mitigate virus induced uh, inflammation. Can we, can we try to target this pathway for mitigating uh, pulmonary infections by viruses like SARS-CoV-2 influenza and LISA viruses? So that's what we proposed here. We have seen that uh, bats have evolved uh, to regulate uh, multiple innate immune and uh, inflammatory signaling pathways. So studying them will help us to leverage specific pathways that can be targeted in uh, 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 pathogenic respiratory infections. So uh, we, the proof of concept that we have is that we have already have seen this at uh, in vitro and cell culture level, both with SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. So we try to uh, establish uh, even the mechanism, how this is actually different between humans and mouse. And our also our goal of studying these reservoir scores on humans, not only to figure out the mechanisms that, uh, that can be targeted for uh, mitigating disease pathogenesis, we also would like to use this information to figure out particular molecular cues. Then we can use those molecular cues to predict the pathogenic potential of genotic viruses which haven't come to the human so far, so that we can be uh, prepared uh, well enough before for these pathogenic viruses if they get genetically transmitted to the humans. So our lab expertise, like we have, we are very good in protein biophysics, biochemistry, and we have a good expertise, a long-standing expertise before uh, on HIV vaccine design. So we are also uh, well equipped, or well uh, interested in genotic viruses and comparative biology. And we also look at many inflammatory uh, inflammation and inflammatory cell death signaling, particularly during RNA virus infections, and how uh, we can use uh, that knowledge to develop therapeutic leads. Uh, thank you very much. Thank Hello. you so much. Yes, thank you so much, sir, for the presentation. And uh, um, could you, yeah, perfect. And. Uh, now we go to the next uh, presentation by Dr. Saigam from the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, Dr. Saigam. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, yeah, you have put up your slides already. The floor is yours. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, thank you so much to organizers, DBT India, uh, Horizon Europe for giving us this platform to present our preliminary work of proposed plan and uh, the uh, capabilities. So I am Zagam Abbas Rizvi, a senior scientist at uh, THSTI, and I'm presenting this uh, on behalf of Dr. Amit Avasti, who unfortunately cannot be here. Uh, and uh, this uh, presentation has been made in collaboration with Dr. Supratik Das and Dr. Tanvi Agarwal. So uh, the broad overview of the project uh, is uh, to uh, understand the host target therapeutics for infectious disease with epidemic potential. And uh, under this title, we would be trying to cover three objectives, characterization of host factors, uh, driving the entry replication and pathogenesis of Nengui and uh, Chikwi infection, uh, and uh, utilizing, uh, number two is utilizing integrated approaches for improved host directed therapy and adjuvants. And number three, finally, is uh, establishment and harmonization of advanced preclinical platform for in vitro and in vivo validation. So uh, under project one, uh, we will be trying to understand uh, and uh, develop uh, and validate a novel host directed therapy. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, doing this under two objectives, screening identification and characterization of normal host-directed therapy, which will be based on host receptor target therapy, uh, pharmacological uh, inhibitors against known, uh, uh, known host targets, or immunotherapeutic targets of the host uh, in case of chikwi and uh, dengue infection, and also formulation and improvement of uh, next-gen adjuvants for existing vaccine candidates. Uh, uh, 
Project number two uh, will basically focus on establishment of advanced preclinical animal platform for chickpea and dengue infection uh, uh, for translation research. And uh, this will be covered under two objectives, immunize mice model for host pathogen interaction, where we will be basically using NSG mice to reconstitute humanized CD34 uh, derived from umbilical cord blood from normal full term birth. And number two is the development and harmonization of human immune organoid. Uh, and then uh, this basically is the third proposal uh, in which our uh, uh, object would be to overall understand the vaccine candidate and host pathogen interaction and use this information for effective vaccine candidate designing and drug therapy. So uh, this will be covered under two objectives, the uh, uh, to provide protein-based platform for subunit vaccine immunogen design for infectious disease. And number two is to understand host pathogen interaction in order to identify drug targets. Uh, we already have some uh, of concept studies uh, in case of Chingui for uh, the vaccine candidates where we have used uh, non-envelope uh, uh, non caspid uh, structural proteins and envelope for uh, the uh, for uh, uh, for developing the very effective vaccine candidates against chickpea and we have shown uh, uh, we have seen that it gives a very potent b and t cell response and we have also uh, developed uh, uh, dengue uh, vaccine using this con uh, construct for uh, at least two serotypes and we are uh, in the process of developing for uh, the remaining two serotypes uh, and uh, then, uh, so this is the overall uh, 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 br um, brief methodology of how uh, we will be using, uh, utilizing the uh, the host, uh, the uh, basically the uh, tag based system for identifying the uh, novel host targets, uh, which will be ultimately characterized by uh, the protein protein uh, assays and uh, mass specs uh, mass mass spectrum photometry, and uh, these will be uh, utilized for identifying uh, host targets for uh, dengue and chikwe infection. And finally, uh, for the chikwe, uh, uh, we have a very uh, dedicated uh, research objective in which we would be like we would like to identify and characterize host cell receptors interacting with envelope or cast with proteins of chickpea virus. And uh, number two is to design and validate drug against identified host receptors. Uh, uh, so uh, then doing a glimpse of uh, the existing capabilities that we have at THSTI, THS, THSTI is uh, having a very uh, advanced uh, infrastructure and uh, research capabilities in terms of a uh, small animal house uh, which houses uh, different transgenic knockout mice uh, and we are in the process of uh, enhancing the facility which uh, will basically cover uh, slightly higher uh, animal models and we have uh, one dedicated infectious disease research facility and a, a newly uh, established uh, new BSL-3 facility and we have uh, we also have a uh, immunology core lab which is well equipped with advanced cutting edge instrument uh, that is very helpful for uh, carrying out uh, preclinical and clinical trials. Uh, in terms of capabilities in vaccine research, we uh, are continuously providing support to develop vaccine candidates through preclinical and clinical uh, trials programs. Uh, we are in the process of developing indigenous uh, vaccine uh, candidate against COVID-19. Uh, and other pathogens, and we also uh, provide training and capacity buildup. Uh, uh, in uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic, we have uh, provided a lot of national and international services, uh, uh, especially uh, in terms of understanding the immunopathology by using animal models such as ACE two and hamster. We have uh, established uh, some very good uh, T cell assays, which are very important for clinical uh, immunogenicity assays and we have also come up with some antiviral drugs against COVID-19 and these are some of the industrial collaborations and academic collaborations for which we have either worked on collaboration mode or service to fee mode and uh, and some of the uh, highlights of COVID-19 vaccine candidate research is given below. Uh, we also uh, are running uh, three uh, very uh, 
under the leadership of Dr. Amit uh, These are uh, the NFLU, uh, Indico, and Incentive uh, uh, program, which basically uh, are, uh, are to uh, come up with a translational research platform to accelerate the development of broadly effective and low-cost influenza vaccine and therapeutics. And uh, what we are looking for in collaboration, we are looking for collaborators who have existing or are uh, developing or are interested in developing non mice animal models, which can be used to test chickweed and denvi vaccine candidates. We are also looking for collaborators who are interested in dynamics of host receptor ligand interaction. Uh, looking for uh, potential collaborators to take POCs, drugs, and vaccine targets for NHP trials. And we are also looking for potential collaborators who are interested in preclinical trials of putative drugs. And we are really thankful for uh, Serum Institute of India, who are uh, who are our industrial partner. Also, uh, uh, Panacea Biotech, which I forgot to uh, you know put. These are our collaborators. Uh, these are our potential collaborators who have uh, Serum Institute basically have agreed to take our uh, Chikvi uh, vaccine candidate forward, and we are collaborating with Panacea for various COVID nineteen vaccine candidates. Uh, with this, I'll end, uh, and I'll be uh, very happy to take up questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zaigam, uh, for uh, presenting on behalf of uh, Dr. Amit. And uh, we go now next to Dr. Rahul Roy from the Department of Chemical Engineering, Indian Institute of Science. Dr. Rahul, a very good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, let me share my screen. Yes, sir, we can. Okay, thank you. So, um, my name is Rahul Roy. I'm a faculty in uh, chemical engineering and bioengineering at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, though I work on infectious diseases. Uh, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Keshav and uh, Sachank, have already introduced the facilities we have at Indian Institute of Science. Uh, so I won't repeat that. Uh, these are my contact details. You should be able to uh, contact me using those. Uh, we uh, focus uh, both at the cellular level, but also at the uh, host human level. Uh, and uh, we feel that many infectious agents are still in India uh, very poorly diagnosed and characterized. And th this is why uh, we have a strong program where we are interested in understanding the prevalence of many pathogens um, at the population level. Uh, this is important for spread of diseases, as you would imagine. Uh, and the population level immunities uh, are also poorly characterized in India. And uh, while I say this from the context of, of Indian diseases uh, with climate uh, change that is happening with global warming, many of these uh, viruses that we study are quite becoming uh, prevalent in uh, Europe as well. And what learnings we can get from India can be translated to uh, Europe, and that's why we think Europe uh, is a good place uh, to kind of start thinking about these problems beforehand. Okay, and our hope is that uh, pre-existing uh, research and, and and new research can help us develop vaccines in advance. We don't do vaccine development at this present moment, but that's the reason why we want to do this. Okay, and and help shape uh, future health policies in different parts of the world. So um, uh, this is our uh, expertise, uh, which is relevant to this particular call. So we do mathematical modeling. Uh, with mathematical modeling, we have shown at the cellular level uh, how um, you can get, there are different bottlenecks you can identify, uh, which can be used to target, which were not previously uh, encountered. Okay, we are testing this model right now. Then we have identified how host uh, evolution also, or and an host immune response also drives the evolution of uh, the pathogen. And as you can see in COVID, this is now uh, 
but being able to predict um, is something that is going to be important in the future of what new viruses will be emerging. And we are trying to do this exercise using modeling. Uh, we are doing immune profiling. As I said, immune selection pressure we found uh, is extremely important. Uh, and we are now characterizing using techniques. Uh, uh, I will describe a little bit uh, in the future uh, slides uh, how we are trying to characterize the immune profiles of an individual and the population. And from there, we will get the right parameters and the right uh, tools to be able to make predictions about how pandemic potential, what is the pandemic potential of a particular pathogen. Okay, uh, we do virus genomics, so you can't think of the host individually, and you can't think of the virus individually. So we believe that uh, we have to do this hand in hand. It is basically a tug of war or kind of a uh, cycle of cascade of evolutions within the host where the virus kind of evolves under these selection pressures. So we do virus genomics uh, and uh, use that to understand how evolution is happening of the viruses. And then uh, we use single molecule imaging technologies uh, which allow us to be very sensitive to these measurements uh, and these techniques then allow us to be able to do these measurements from a very small amount of sample of blood so that eventually yeah, everything could be at the site of uh, the patient uh, or at, at home, okay? So uh, with this, uh, we have uh, thought about at least two problems that uh, we are very interested in collaborating with. Uh, but of course, again, uh, this is our plans and, and depending on EU groups, we are interested in talking to them about many of the issues that are uh, common to others as well. Uh, so two problems that we are very interested in and we're pushing for are uh, high throughput multiplex antibody profiling technologies that can detect uh, serum antibodies against not one or two pathogens, but a uh, very large number of pathogens and variants of pathogens uh, uh, with single molecule sensitivity. So this is something that we uh, have started work on and have got support uh, for, for um, demonstrating proof of concept. We are also interested in the co-evolution of the uh, RNA viruses. Mostly we are doing this for dengue uh, and we are interested in talking to others who would like to apply this to other viruses on the immune scape evolution. Uh, and this we do it both by looking at the host but also the virus at the same time and then uh, using mathematical modeling to predict what goes on. So here's the schema for how we are doing the uh, multiplex antibody profiling, we take our target pathogens. Uh, uh, currently our panel has 25 pathogens. We do bioinformatics analysis, we gen synthesize antigen sequences, we produce those antigens, and then uh, we either uh, we put them on chips or on beads, and then we try to uh, evaluate SIRA from people uh, and volunteers to evaluate what is the uh, level of uh, antibody against any pathogen, what is the ability of their, their ability to neutralize them. And all of this, we want to do this in a high throughput fashion so that uh, you can generate data for thousands of people at the same time. Uh, this is the other project where we are interested in how when the virus uh, infects somebody, it evolves over time. And this evolution is of course shaped by the immunity level and the pre-existing pre pre uh, antibodies in the particular person and how that causes the evolution of these uh, viruses in the population. And this is particularly relevant uh, from India because uh, in India, unlike other places, we have been getting exposed to many of these viruses. So we have pre-existing antibodies against many of these viruses. So we believe that uh, viruses that did not exist were not originally present uh, in European countries, they will evolve into, uh, under these immune selection pressures, will evolve into much more established viruses. And, and, and this is something was seen in COVID already. Uh, so we uh, are definitely looking for, uh, so we use some single cell sequencing, but we are looking for collaborators who can help us in single cell sequencing, data analysis, and, um, and machine learning, we are generating antibody cartography data that will allow us to uh, 
generate a huge multi-dimensional data sets, which we would need help with in uh, analyzing uh, through machine learning and standard methods. Uh, and then of course, uh, we want to use this data sets to model and making predictions in the future. So I'll stop here uh, and I'm happy to take questions if somebody has. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahul. And this was uh, our last presentation on the agenda because Professor Gabriela Godali from Lund University of Sweden unfortunately was not able to, to join us today, but she has uh, you know, uh, shared her contact details and also her presentation, which we will make available to all the participants uh, at the end of the, after the webinar. So you will have the uh, possibility to getting uh, contact uh, with her if you're interested in, uh, she's looking for consortium partners. She's from the University of Sweden, uh, Professor Gabriela Godali. Um, I, I also mentioned in the chat that we have still a bit of time left over. Uh, so if there's someone of you out there uh, who would like to give a short talk, a presentation about a, a project idea, uh, you know, uh, expertise offer, so we could accommodate it now. Um, if you would like to to talk or you have a presentation maybe even ready, uh, you could uh, raise your hand uh, in the uh, chat function. Yeah, we have uh, we have one here, Akanshka Chaturvedi. So we'll just give you the opportunity to present yourself, please, and um, uh, share share what you have. Uh, to present. Yeah, uh, Ms. Akanshka. Sorry, sorry. Um, I was talking on mute. Um, no problem. Sorry. So yeah. um, this is Akanshka Chaturvedi. I am from National um, Center for Cell Science, Pune. And I'm a B-cell biologist and um, um, I thought I've been listening to all the panelists and I thought uh, since there's a time and you mentioned in the chat, I'll briefly mention about what um, we do in the lab and uh, where is it that we are seeking collaboration and that collaboration is, um, you know, not only what we're looking at is uh, for collaboration, not uh, only limited to Europe, but also within India, because, you know, when I'm listening to everybody from, you know, researchers from India, I'm realizing there's a lot of scope of, um, you know, uh, a lot of potential for collaboration within the country as well. So, um, um, so um, um, my I am interested in B cell biology, and we have been um, uh, working to understand a lot of basic B cell biology. Um, my major interest is to see how B cells receive signal from the B cell receptor and toll-like receptors, um, and how they integrate the two signals because B cells are the ones that also express a lot of uh, pattern recognition receptors. And the pattern recognition receptors are very important because many of their ligand are used as an adjuvant in the new vaccines. So that is my basic uh, um, um, interest. But in addition to that, um, since COVID came, when I was setting my lab, COVID hit the, you know, the globe. And uh, I in immediately started to utilize my understanding of um, memory and memory cells and the uh, plasma B cells to um, uh, generate human monoclonal antibodies. We have generated a huge panel of hum human monoclonal antibodies um, uh, that neutralize um, not only Wuhan variant, but Delta variant as well, and also strongly um, neutralize some of the Omicron variants. Uh, we have transferred some of these uh, clones to Bharat Biotech for further optimization. But eventually I moved to look into, you know, some of the rare diseases where there is a threat, but we do not, you know, uh, we do not have a really, uh, uh, you know, good therapeutics or we are in the process of, you know, we still want more therapeutics. One of that is a rabies virus. And because, um, you know, rabies is probably not, not the first infectious disease that will come to our mind when we talk of the infectious disease, but it's still a global problem every year, 60,000 you know, like 60,000 people die of COVID and it is really an underestimate. A huge problem happens in India. Um, and there is a, you know, the vaccines do work, but uh, many of the cases where the dogs are rabid or when there is, um, um, you know, like the uh, third degree bite, in addition to the uh, uh, vaccines, what we also need to deliver is the uh, uh, rabies immunoglobulins. 
Now, the rabies immunoglobulins are really in short supply. So the alternative for that is the mono, human monoclonal antibodies. Um, we do have, um, so, so far in the entire world, only in India, um, monoclonal antibodies are approved. One of them is a single human monoclonal antibody that is marketed by serum uh, as rabies shield marketed by serum. And the problem with that antibody is it doesn't neutralize a couple of strains that are prevalent outside India. Uh, another human monoclonal antibody, which is a cocktail of two murine monoclonal antibodies, is um, by Zydus. Um, so there is a huge scope. And now rabies through bats is making a comeback on through raccoons, is making a comeback in many of the Western countries in the last couple of years. We've seen um, um, non-dog-mediated rabies deaths in uh, Western countries. And because of the um, change in the climate, because of the urbanization, you know, the boundary between the wildlife and the domestic uh, domesticated animals and the humans have been fading. So that is making a, you know, it's a real glo global threat. So, um, uh, you know, in, in, in line with the One Health program, we have uh, started to generate human monoclonal antibodies against rabies. And we uh, have already got some uh, really promising clones. And uh, what we are looking for, so we have the expertise of generating human monoclonal antibodies in a very short time frame uh, from looking from getting the uh, blood sample from the convalescent uh, individuals. Uh, we are now in the process of standardizing the protocol that we can, you know, if someone has been infected 10 years earlier, we should be able to get human monoclonals from them as well. Um, that is the expertise that we offer in addition to a lot of basic B-cell biology like uh, what Serum was looking for, uh, like mucosal immune responses and all that. But um, um, what I'm looking for is um, uh, structural determination of some of the monoclonal antibody clones that we have obtained against rabies. Um, and also, um, um, you know, um, where we can do um, 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 animal experimentation to see uh, whether uh, how good these antibodies are in terms of uh, 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 protection. Um, and thank you again. Thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. And um, um, I'll be happy to take any questions and looking for collaborations in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for, uh, for your intervention. Um... That was very nice. And um, I think we have now uh, ended the se session about um, flash presentations. And we are very happy now to introduce to you uh, Dr. Michael Brown, who is an EU expert. And Dr. Michael Brown is working on uh, matchmaking. He's helping uh, Indian partners to find European partners and uh, he will now give you a, a brief overview about the opportunities and challenges which come under this kind of calls and how you know to bypass them and how to find you know the right consortium so mr michael Brown has an ex long expertise in uh european commission horizon europe uh calls and projects and we're very happy that he has you know joined us uh, for this event today uh, good afternoon michael and the floor is yours thank you samrat Thank you to everybody who organized this impressive event and thank you to all the speakers. I'm really impressed by what I have heard, especially from all the speakers who presented their research expertise and their research ideas. And I'm very, very optimistic that there is a tremendous potential of research on these infectious diseases with epidemic potential in India uh, which would be beneficial also for European partners and vice versa. But my, my humble expertise in helping to make the matches between research partners from different continents suggests also that this is only the first step. Yes, if you're here today, you are interested in partnership and you have something to offer and you have something which you would like to see from Europe, which would you like to... But it can be sometimes a bumpy road from this intention to realizing it. And uh, I think that in particular, according to my humble expertise, you will encounter three challenges on this way. The first one is be aware that this is a EU call, which is primarily targeting researchers from Europe. India as an associated 
country is able to participate, but this means that you have to find your place in consortia, which typically are led by EUs. Sorry, this is not even typically. Uh, coordination must always be with the EU partner or with UK, in, as, as we've just learned. And you must find your place in such a consortium because European researchers have the established history in collaborative research and they have the established networks. And our experience is that consortia for such a new call like this one are forming mostly already now or even latest soon after the call opens. And that the consortia then take a lot, spend a long time on refining it, but that the stakes are set in the first months or sometimes even weeks of opening the call. So what you have to do is you have to be fast. It does not help if you find a partner next week in March, even if theoretically you still have time to do this because then the consortia exists already. So the first thing is approach your target partners as early as possible. This means identify not only some partners, but find out who would be your preferential partner and then try to engage cooperation discussions with this partner early because only through this you can secure your place in the consortium before the slots are filled. And if you don't have this right EU partner, if you don't know who is your ideal partner, your dream partner, and where possible backups, we and the colleagues which have spoken today, we will be more than happy to help you. But then you have to do a second thing. You cannot just take up the phone, call them, and say, hello, I would like to cooperate with you. Our experience is that the first meeting with them is decisive. In this decisive me first meeting with them, you must get clearly across what value can you add to their consortium research topic, and also what value are you looking for from a EU-led consortium in which you would like to become a partner. So you must have some key messages ready. And I've seen in the last presentations of the research ideas which you have that there are clear key messages, but in the end, it must be clear for your European partner is and I, had, and I had such partner discussions where the Europeans, they asked very, very bluntly, what's in it for me? What, do I, what, what is the benefit for me for taking a research partner from India on board of our already existing consortium? So you see, this creates an environment where you are selling an idea to a European partner and where the European partner must vice versa also sell your, his research concept to him so that he can get you on board. And then getting on board is the next challenge which you will encounter because Horizon Europe is quite a complicated administrative and regulatory environment. I will not repeat what Vivek especially said about this already, but understanding the requirements and ensuring the compliance with the requirements and the fit with the consortium is also something where we believe that maybe we can all help you a little bit in realizing this. But when you start approaching Europeans, there are two ways how you can approach them. And I've seen elements of them in both of them. One of them is what I call the push approach, where you have already a tangible idea for a research project and where you are searching for the ideal EU partner who fits to your project idea. And let me remind you who can set up and coordinate a consortium around this idea, because this consortium will always be EU based and you will be an associated partner with it. The other way is the pull approach where you say, I have specific expertise and research to offer and where your ideal partner would be and maybe an already existing or emerging EU-led consortium, which needs your research expertise and which is very willing to take you on board. And these are two different approaches and you have to be sensitive about what approach do you have. And my experience is that the pull approach is easier to realize if you have a clear message and if you find a consortium already, you can convey to them that working with India will add value beyond what Europeans alone can do, then you will find open doors. If you want to push your idea, this may put you into a situation where you will not find a consortium which has exactly the same idea as you have. 
And in an extreme case, if you want to insist, and if you really think your idea is absolutely convincing, then you will have to find European partners who are willing to work with you on setting up a new consortium, which does not yet exist. And let me assure you, this is a lot of work. So you have to be sensitive about what approach do you pursue, how much effort can you put into it, and how likely is it that you find the ideal partner for one of these approaches. And finding the right partner can be, in some cases, finding the needle in the haystack. So you must scan the right sources for finding your best partner. This can be the database of Horizon Europe projects. This can be scientific literature. I will not, again, repeat what Vivek said, but we will be happy to help you with this. And how do we typically proceed in such a Horizon Europe matchmaking initiative? We go through four steps. The first one is we try to identify cooperation potentials. We try to identify potential partners. So we work our way very carefully through the call, especially because the call clearly defines which pathogens are eligible and it also defines what kind of research is eligible. And from this, and from matching this with literature research, scanning project databases, going to matching events like the one today, we typically develop a long list of potential partners. Then we try to prepare the matchmaking, which we could do rather fast now, as I said, which we should be do farther first, where first we, from our side, we have first individual meetings with potential lead research partners to identify their research topics, to understand them, and to confirm the principal interest so that we can define a pool of identified potential lead institutions for priority research topics. And this is important because in Europe, you have in each of these disease areas, you have leading research institutes. And you must be aware that the applications for this call will by far exceed the number of projects which will be awarded. And typically the rejection rate can be 90 or 95% here. So maybe only one out of 20 proposals will make it to be selected. This means that you don't just want to try to find any partner in Europe, you try to find the best European partners because only with them you have a chance of being selected. Otherwise you waste invest a lot of time, a lot of effort or just be receiving a message at the end next year that you will be rejected. So if we have found those lead institutions, then we cannot pursue everybody. So typically we must concentrate on maybe three to five research topics which have the highest matching and winning potential in along the dimensions which I de described. And then we tend to speak with each of the potential lead institutions, both from India and from EU, before to prepare the real match making. So this means we try to validate the proposed research target and topic, and we try to confirm the readiness to enjoy, to, to join EU-India matchmaking meetings. And then comes the decisive step, which I believe should take place before the end of this year, latest in January, otherwise you run into the time restrictions, which I mentioned in the beginning, where then you sit face to face presumably in a, in a Zoom meeting, to speak with your partner in Europe and to speak about uh, what are you doing, what are we doing, how does that fit together, can we, sub, can we cooperate? And this is typically where our support ends because my mandate does not cover helping you to write a proposal, but we can still give you some help. So what we can do is from our side, to help you is to identify the best partners for your research idea or your research competency, to identify EU-led consortia with fit for you, and which would be the right ones to cooperate with. We can arrange the matching meetings. We can help you to prepare the matching meetings, and we can also help you to understand the relevant context. And let me end here. You have my contact data. You can contact me also via the colleagues in India anytime. And I hope that these practically oriented more hints, you will find them helpful in realizing your idea. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Samrat and colleagues, for making it possible that I can join this event. 
Thank you so much, Michael, for this very valuable uh, insights. I think they, I know they are like uh, so important to know like what are the real challenges and how to tackle them. And I think you have so much expertise in the past and experience, uh, and that's really very great, uh, you know, that to have you here. And also for all the presenters and participants, please use Dr. Michael Brown. I'm really saying like he's a, a key expert on on matchmaking, and you can really like rely on him to help you to find you know the, the maybe the perfect match. Um, so Michael has is uh, leaving his slides with us, his contact details. We will share with them with you after the webinar. Thank you so much, Michael, again. And with this, uh, we come to the end of today's, I think, very informative uh, uh, networking brokerage session. And it is a great uh, pleasure and honor for us to uh, welcome Dr. Abhishek Singh from the International Corporation Division from the Department of Biotechnology, DBT, um, for giving the closing remarks of today's event. Dr. Abhishek. So, first of all, uh, good evening to all of you. And uh, my apologies because I was busy in another meeting. So, in the start of the meeting, I couldn't join the meeting. And in the vote of thanks, first of all, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to all scientific community members like Dr. Rahul Roy, Dr. Parichet Tyagi, and uh, uh, Professor Amit Avasthi and other esteemed members. So, since this call has focused on host pathogen interaction, and uh, we all of are aware that the viral pathogenicity and uh, information on viral database is like a Pandora box. So, we don't know on the upcoming morning what we are going to face and what we are going to see. So we have to get ready with the effective and uh, open-ended multidisciplinary consortiums through the regular exchanges of information, knowledge, and uh, high-end uh, technologies uh, for the upcoming future. So I am hoping that uh, we would see proposals not on the uh, comfort zone of scientific community members, but even for the upcoming challenges also. So like uh, I was uh, going through the uh, presentation when uh, one uh, presentation on rabies and B-cell was going on. So even we have vaccines, but we are still in the progress for the upgradation of our uh, availability and uh, upgradation of the knowledge. So whatever the resources and whatever the knowledge we have and whatever we are going to achieve and what we are going to look for. So everything we are looking for in the upcoming call as a proposals in the wider spectrum of areas. Along with that, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Srini Kaveri and Dr. Vivek Dham, as well as Dr. Samrat S. Kumar for uh, convening this uh, very knowledge exchange as well as high-end uh, meeting as a webinar for the upcoming call, which is going to open in the next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Abhishek, for your, for your kind uh, uh, words and uh... With this, I also would like to invite Dr. Vivek uh, from the EU delegation to uh, share a few final words to the participants. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Yeah, thank you, Samrat. Uh, just on lighter note, uh, Dr. Rahul uh, Abhishek's present itself uh, give a partial guarantee that the DBT is committed to the call. And uh, so any difficulties for this uh, technical, uh, please don't hesitate to contact Abhishek. So he's quite uh, proactive in... Uh, responding so that is uh, <clears throat> the one thing but what i reiterate what i already mentioned and dr brown had already mentioned that you are uh, running against the time so you need to be visible the first thing uh, don't wait for the uh, someone to approach so you have to make sure that you proactively approach to the potential partners in europe and the europeans will be doing the same thing so uh, time is the key and visibility is the second important thing 
And the lastly, what I suggest and already Samrat had mentioned that uh, we are uh, um, having, uh, we cannot share the participant data because of the data protection uh, constraint. So I urge all the participants who wants to make USL visible, available and potential uh, partners uh, expression. So send a few slides to Samrat so that we can upload on the website we will also sharing this information with the European uh, NCP so that they can circulate your availability and expertise to a potential partner. So don't hesitate and uh, we wish you all the best and uh, uh, we look forward to receive a uh, very quality proposals. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for your participation. Thank you so much, uh, Vivek. And once again, thank you for all the attendees who have joined and shown their interest. Thank you to the presenters, Dr. Srini, and also all the uh, flash presenters, uh, Dr. Michael Brown also. And uh, with this, I, I just echo what uh, Dr. Vivek said. Uh, please uh, now try to find uh, the consortium, try to find the partners and uh, you know apply for this very important and, and uh, great call. And we hope to you know see some successful stories uh, uh, coming then from this uh, call between EU and India. And with this, I officially close the webinar and you will receive a link for the recording and all the presentations uh, probably on Monday. I think today we won't manage, but Monday will be in your inbox. Thank you so much. Have a good evening here in India and a good uh, lunchtime in Europe. Bye.